when they first introduced QFT to me, I was like, okay, this is really cool, but how do I integrate it and where do I go after I have these questions? So I think the key to success is that you use the questions. If the students don't feel that their questions are valid, they're going to shut down next time you try to do a QFT. So having some kind of plan and you don't have to have the answers, but just allowing the students to move forward with their priority question somehow. If you don't use them, talking about the questions, you will lose them. The them in that case is the students. You have to use, because otherwise it just becomes another teacher activity. I used mine to drive my unit. This other teacher I worked with in science, she used hers to drive her lab. You know, you, you, the kids have to see their questions because when they do, what I love about the aspect of when they see their questions show up as the assessment or as the thing that measures the learning is that that rigor and relevance goes through the roof. It's relevant to them because it was their question. But secondly, and most importantly, the rigor goes through the roof because they're not going to let you leave it. Sometimes it's just a hook. Sometimes it's just a discussion to teach a processing skill or a way of analyzing things. Um, a lot of the students really like it as a project. They like to find their answer. They like to work collaboratively. And they really like to present to show what they've learned. And I'd always ask, you know, what's your question answered? Did you answer the question? Were you able to? And, and initially I'm like, did I tell you the answer? Did I tell you which page to turn to or which website to look at? And it's that early process where we're building that, that sense of empowerment that you can do this. You have the, cap you have the capability, the tools, the, the, no, the wherewithal to solve your own problems or questions when, when you put your mind to it. I definitely think that moving into the future, being able to have this as um, a tool when writing papers that need research questions and um, going into a broad topic, being able to make a list of questions and being able to narrow it down and change the questions in a way that it could be useful to me in the future. Um, so I think it has been such a valuable lesson to me. We make sure that everyone's questions get presented to the whole class. And then what we'll do is read all the questions that the students have and I'll post them up and around the wall. And then we also do um, a new thing, which is interviewing people. So when we were doing our community helpers, we were interviewing the police officer at our school and we invited a firefighter to come to our school and we interviewed him. And so that was super fun for the kids to interview people who actually were community helpers and those were our primary sources. So we knew that we were getting credible answers from experts. The Q Focus had a collection of images and a quote. The quote was alluding to the fact that why would we even need to describe something with so many intricacies with words when sometimes it's just easier to take that one thing and look at it. Out of your questions you created, choose five that you feel will help you better describe a thing that no one has seen. I said, we're gonna do something with those questions. They had to write an ode to an invention and uh, they had fun with it. They had to draw their invention and accompany their ode with it. And that was our final project for the semester. After students have used the QFT to understand either a document or a cartoon or a photograph or, or a video, I use the Q Focus later during an assessment. I use them either for short answers, sometimes for essays, sometimes I put it into a multiple choice question, and it's in a more academic context. So for example, in the one I just did with this cartoon, I would just have a prompt, something like, analyze cultural beliefs of Americans in the late 1800s that justified expansionist policies. So even though their questions were like, why is that guy sitting over there? It really is the same thing as evaluating cultural beliefs of uh, American imperialists. The academic language comes when, when they start to understand it. When they're finally being assessed, they'll be able to rise to the occasion and understand those prompts. My computer science students are seeing the benefits as they go through these questions and asking the how, why, 
what those are questions that they need to um, establish and learn how to do if they're going to go through a debugging process. Like if something runs wrong with a program, okay, why, how um, do we need to do it this way? Is it another way? Also, not only the debugging process before you even get that, like, okay, why am I developing this app? Who am I developing this app for? What is it going to do? And I think that's essential because it gets to go to the design process. When you create environments and you empower them with answering their own questions, it's not only empowering, it's also liberating for some of our young men and for students, I believe. And, and they take that and, and they, they run with it, especially the way the system grinds, grinds them. Um, it's about, about correct answers, answers and correct answers, not about the questions. It also gives students an opportunity to speak. Um, I have students who don't like, sometimes don't like to talk, but when you're asking questions, you know, even in the virtual, I have them read it. Um, it's still a, it's an opportunity for student voice. And student voice is always important because it can lead to so many other things. That led to asking the question. It led to now collaborating with your peers to now you're standing before a group of students of your peers presenting to the principal, community members, and others. Um, and you know, now you can, you know, take the oath of office if you choose and, not, and feel comfortable doing it. 